Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 31 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. Happy Shark Week, Gavin. Absolutely. Happy Shark Week, Mike. Um, and it seems to be fitting. Sharks are the theme of this week's episode. It was not what I was going to do, not what I had planned for this week. But then once I realized it was Shark Week, uh, because for reasons that we will get into, maybe, uh, I don't really follow Shark Week that much anymore. I used to as a kid, uh, but not really much anymore. And it's definitely one of those things for me where it's, I know I followed it more when I was younger and I don't know if I just lost interest because I got older or because mm -hmm. it changed or a combination of both. Por que no los dos. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, this episode's a little strange. So we're going to be talking about sharks themselves and their evolution in this episode. And then because I have very much to talk about, about sharks, there's not enough really time without this being like a two hour long episode for us to put uh, sh me talking about sharks and shark week in the same episode. So we're going to do sort of a, an episode 35 or 31.5 or so, hopefully sometime this weekend, whenever Mike uh, gets, gets around to putting that part up um, where I, where I just sort of talk about shark week, the history of shark week and why shark week kind of sucks now. Um, yes, yeah, so we got a little sort of, Two parter, but you know, one and a half parter. I guess you could exactly. Call it, where we got the uh, the hardcore, uh, you know, sharks, which is what we're going to be doing today, which I'm really looking forward to. And then you know, Shark Week, and you know, I have I have no idea why Shark Week is bad, although I completely believe it. And so <laughs> I am uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the media criticism that is coming in episode thirty one point five, which I believe is our first bonus episode, unless I'm misremembering. I believe so. Wonderful. We're we're doing this whole podcast thing. We're real podcasters. <laughs> All right. So uh, with that sort of little announcement out of the way, our typical announcements, uh, if you feel like uh, if you are a scientist doing some interesting research things or just have an interesting topic to that you would like us to talk about, uh, we have forms for both of those things down below in the show notes as well as uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter at dead podcast underscore uh, to keep up on all sorts of uh, fun sciencey things that are that are going on in the realm of uh, science Twitter, which is very active. I love science Twitter. Are there any other uh, like accounts that we should be plugging with? Uh, you know, in addition to our own. Honestly, most of the people that I just sort of retweet on there regularly. Uh, there's one. He's a paleontologist, I believe, at University of Maryland, uh, named Tom Holtz. He retweets many articles a day. Uh, that are all open source. And uh, so you can read the full, you know, scientific article for free. Uh, he He's very good at doing that. So that's off the top of my head, somebody to go to go follow as well, if you're interested in, in reading scientific papers. And if you're interested in any more people to follow, you can absolutely go check out the feed over at dead podcast underscore and see all of the, uh, the other wonderful, wonderful science accounts that have been uh, deemed deemed useful by Gavin. Absolutely. So do we have it this week in science? We do. And I was a little torn. So if you remember to last episode, we didn't actually do one. I had a little rant. And so yes. there was one that I had planned, like an actual paleontology related one from last week that I had planned to do this week. But there's a paleontology one this week too, that sort of lines up with that rant that I had had last time. <laughs> okay. If, so or just to refresh everybody, anyone who may not have listened last week, what was the, the rant last week about? The rant was pretty much just about how a lot of, I, I shouldn't say a lot. Science reporting. It was, it was, it was about science reporting, science reporting yeah. because it's a paper got published suggesting because science does not prove things. It suggests but a paper was put out suggesting that dinosaurs were uh, declining significantly for about 10 million years uh, before the asteroid hit 66 million years ago. And many, many, many of the articles that I saw talking about that, these are like popular articles, not in like a, a journal, um, you know, for like news outlets like CNN and such. Uh, their headlines, at the very least, most of them the body of the, the article as well, made it seem like it's now solved. This, this is for real a thing. And it's like, well, no, this was one paper. One paper is never 
enough evidence to support any given hypothesis, which is what we do in science. And the reporting on that just went kind of wonky. So this week we have a This Week in Science that is uh, that is based in that? Yes. So have you got a year for me? 2014. You would have... Uh, See, now I'm conflicted because that was the year of the one that we skipped last week that I was going to do this week. So I'll give no, you a half. If I don't we'll give you it, some half. Half if credit. I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay. Well, this is How from 2011. Okay. So this is from uh, July 13th. Uh, so if you're listening to this today, it comes out yesterday. Uh, but of 2011. And the title says, quote, youngest, unquote, dinosaur found. Which... Hmm. Is not the way I would have phrased it, but like I understand, because they they don't actually mean like a baby; they mean most, most recent. recent. Yes, that that was yeah, that was where my head first went, and then I was like, "Ooh, it could be either one." That's yeah, that seems like odd phrasing, but okay. Yeah. Uh, so, paleontologists from Yale University announced the recovery and reconstruction of what they said were the remains of the youngest dinosaur on record to that point. Youngest again, meaning most recent. Other than birds, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, preserved in the fossil record, the remains of a horn likely belonging to a triceratops was uh, dated to only slightly before the catastrophic meteor impact that most paleontologists believe annihilated the dinosaurs entirely some... This says 65 million years ago. It's, it's 66. Come on. <sighs> Get it together. Get it together, calendar. Importantly... This discovery indicates the dinosaurs had not gone extinct prior to the meter's impact. Exact dating efforts on the horn placed it as having lived between 2,000 and 10,000 years prior to the extinction of all dinosaurs on Earth. It doesn't say except for birds, which is a really important caveat. <laughs> but, yeah. So, and this also sort of has that, the opposite problem, where an article got published suggesting again that this was when that this this horn from this animal was from and it's like okay but yes that strongly suggests they weren't extinct by the time the thing hit but that doesn't really mean that they they were doing well you know which is also what right. what this little thing sort of implies so it has the same problem but implies the opposite suggestion <laughs> i need to look up reviews of some good science calendars if you know should we continue doing this into next year <laughs> yeah we need uh we need a better calendar <laughs> we need, or maybe just a different bit maybe maybe the uh there's no good science calendars and we just need a new bit Ooh. to begin the show all right all right well we'll think about I'm it not, we'll think about it i'm not i'm not opposed to finding a new one but i'm just just you know maybe we can i don't know i'm open to options here yeah well all right so with that out of the way, we can get to the uh, the main course of the show, which is sharks. Yes, sharks. So sharks are an incredibly interesting group of animals. And like there is a reason why Shark Week exists. Sharks are incredibly fascinating animals. Uh, and so far, anyway, on the podcast, this is the group that is most different from our own anatomy that we're going to, that we have talked about like in depth, like for mm -hmm. example, you know, we've talked about pterosaurs, you know, they are much more like us than sharks are. We've talked about various different kinds of dinosaurs. They are much more like us than sharks are. They might not seem like it, especially because they lived so long ago. We have sharks now. So we just sort of as associate sharks more with ourselves sort of in that way. But sharks are just totally alien. Not nearly as alien as things like, you know, octopuses and, and things like that, but. But definitely in the context of things we've talked about, it is, you know, just wildly different. Absolutely. So, Mike, as the resident layperson, what is a shark? Um, a water dwelling. I want to say re yeah, large is a finicky word. Yeah. So, and even, even as I'm saying that, I, I believe there are some sharks that are actually just not that large at all. Uh, ooh. Water-dwelling carnivores mm -hmm. that, um, <sighs> hmm. 
Hmm. Water dwelling carnivores that have you know a tail and fins and are kind of shaped. And, uh, this is not going to be scientific. <laughs> shaped like shaped like a shark is uh is the best way. Like there's a particular shape that Ooh, every time the... I think of a shark, big shark, little shark, mm-hmm. different kinds of shark, they've got the same rough. Um, right shape and there are some variations on that like and we will absolutely be shark. talking we'll be talking very much about shark shape throughout quite a lot of this because today sharks are the only shark shaped things but they have not been the only shark shaped things in the past Ooh, okay interesting so but yeah i you know i'm gonna go with you know ocean dwelling salt water dwelling um carnivores mm-hmm. um that you know, all seem to have a particular shape. I think I may have been onto something there, but that is, okay. that's about as far as I think I can get. So it's one of those things, as we've talked about before, you know, when you see it, right? Yes. So, and you wouldn't, what, what was the quote that you said or who said it, it was a Supreme court justice that said yes. it, correct? A Supreme court justice were referring to porn as yes. know, what's porn and what's, you know, what crosses lines. And it's like, I know it when I see it. Right. And so sharks are really interesting because they're so ubiquitous today. Everybody knows what a shark is, just as sort of we talk about with birds, you know, even though we haven't fully broken down birds, we will at some point, but but you know it when you see it, Mm -hmm. but what makes a shark different than say other fish? Because sharks are fish by most people's definition. Okay. And what, what counts as a fish then? Um, more or less a vertebrate with jaws. Okay. So by that, we are also fish, technically. <laughs> I mean, phylogenetically, we absolutely are fish. That is absolutely true. Um, which I think we've we've talked about at length before in one of one of our lead, early okay. episodes. We are fish. We are fish. However, there's a there are many really important differences that you once they're pointed out, they make much more sense. Okay, But many people wouldn't think of them off the top of their head between sharks and their close relatives. And what most people think of as fish, things like bass, perch, tuna, etc. So sharks are members of a group called chondrichthys, which are the cartilaginous fish. Which means cartilaginous. Yes, that's exactly what that means. Whereas most fish that you are thinking of are members of the group osteichthys or bony fish. Mm -hmm. So you've probably heard this at some point in your life. Sharks don't have bones. All of their bones are cartilage. I feel like that's one of those things I've heard for the first time, several times, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like I've heard it several times and each time it's like, oh my God, I had no idea. So that is the biggest sort of most noticeable difference between Sharks and relatives, and so I, even though, like I said, sharks are fish. When I say fish for the rest of this episode, just be, for shorthand, I mean bony fish that most people think of as fish. Okay. So that is sort of the biggest difference that most people think of. However, there are many, many more differences. So one that again makes sense, un- like once it's pointed out, but that very few people would ever notice is that their fins are not attached to their head. Their pectoral fins, the front fins that sort of come out to the side. Right. They're not attached to their heads, whereas in bony fish, they are. So sharks have a neck, whereas right. fish, fish do not. Oh, okay. Um, their jaws are not even attached to their skull. So like their top jaw and bottom jaw are connected to each other, but they are not connected to their cranium. Real, mm. which is why when you see a shark sort of attack something, it looks like they're shooting their jaws forward because they are. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, hmm. Whereas in fish, obviously, the jaws are attached to the head. Uh, the jaws are underneath their head as well. If you look at something like a bass, its mouth is right at the front of its face. Whereas with sharks, it's moved sort of underneath like it is sort of like in a human underneath the cranium and underneath the eyes instead of in front of Mm -hmm. their scales are incredibly different. Uh, So scales, they sure do. And they feel like sandpaper. In fact, many uh, sort of like 
uh, Pacific Islander uh, sort of cultures would would use shark skin as sandpaper to sand things. Really? Okay. It, it is it is very smooth. If if you were to pet a shark from head to tail, it's incredibly smooth. But if you were to pet it from tail to head, it it's very rough. And shark researchers often will get like shark burn, you know, like rug burn. Uh, because they rub up against a shark the wrong way, you know, too hard, or the shark like thrashes and and gives you a pretty bad friction burn. I mean, I feel like the friction burn might be the least of your problems there, but well, depending on what kind of shark. Fun. But well, fair, yeah. But their scales are incredibly different. So bony fish, uh, their scales are mostly made out of bone as well. However, with sharks, they're Scales are called dermal denticles. Which means... So dermal means skin. Yes. And denticle translates to tiny teeth. Huh. Their scales are... Like, eerily similar to the structure of teeth. Okay. Where they have an inner pulp cavity that has blood vessels and, and things attached to it. In each scale? In each scale. Wow. Around okay. the outside of that is a layer of dentin, which you have in your teeth. And then I've around that before, yes. is a layer that is not quite, but very, very, very similar to enamel. Very hmm. similar. So okay. sharks are literally covered in teeth. So they... so. I guess that's part of, I guess that makes sense as to why their skin can be used as sandpaper is that mm -hmm. that sounds like it's just really hard. Like, you know, teeth are hard, much harder than, you know, my skin. And if their entire body is covered in this, then mm -hmm. that makes some amount of sense. And they're also shaped in a way that uh, makes sort of, almost like, like a golf ball sort of effect that reduces drag in the water, um, which is why they're smooth one way and rough the other way. Right. Uh, but... They're so similar to the structure of teeth that uh, there's a lot of speculation that this is how we actually got teeth. That the that before there were animals with teeth or vertebrates with teeth anyway, they had scales with this structure, and that somehow that mm -hmm. evolves into what we have today. Yes. That seems like one hell of a uh, of an evolutionary chain, but okay. Well, I mean, wait till we talk about Jaws in a future episode. That blew my mind the first time I heard about it. Well, okay. Um, when you're saying Jaws, you mean like you know literal Jaws? Literal like, Jaws. Movie. Yeah. Okay. Like like the ones in your face. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to wanted to make sure we were going with this. No. No. Okay. That that's a good clarification because we are talking about sharks. <laughs> yes. But that was. I think that's why I was a little confused. Um, so moving on from, from the scales. So they have exposed sort of gills. In fish, they have sort of a, a bone that covers their gills on the side of their head called an operculum mm -hmm. that covers their gills where sharks don't. You know, sharks have gill slits in their skin. Right. Um, and so their gills are much more exposed. Whereas like if you were, you know, say a tuna for whatever reason decided to attack you hitting it in the gills would not be all that effective because they have a pretty solid bone that covers their gills. Whereas if you, you know, if you're being attacked by a shark, one of the things that most people probably at least in the back of their mind have been, have been told at some point to do is like hit it in its gills or like in its eye. That's a separate thing, but hit it in its oh, yeah. gills because they're not protected. And I imagine that's a rather sensitive area. Absolutely. Uh, they don't have a swim bladder like bony fish do. So bony fish have a sack that they can fill with air to keep themselves uh, buoyant in the water so they can move up and down as they want. Sharks do not have that. So how do they move up and down? Is it just like sheer swimming? Partially. Um, so that's part of the reason why we think that their pectoral fins are not attached to their head. So they can be out to the side and produce lift as they are swimming. So they produce a little bit of lift as they're moving forward anyway. Right. But they also, in their liver, produce lots and lots of oils. 
which are less dense than water. You know, oil floats on water. So their uh-huh. liver is just super, super oily. And that keeps them more or less neutrally buoyant. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. That, and that's what, like, we've talked about a lot of cool animal facts. Mm-hmm. Underrated and low key, but that <laughs> might be one of the coolest ones is that the a shark's liver can keep them as roughly as buoyant as they need to move mm-hmm. comfortably around in the water. That's it is that's much, wild. much less efficient than a bony fish's swim bladder. I, I mean, I can only imagine, but even still, right. that's a really awesome little feature. And I'll tell you, I've, I've dissected a good handful of sharks in my time, and they really are just incredibly oily <laughs> on the inside. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll save my questions about that for the end, but I want to know what that <laughs> is. Uh, so sharks have what are called claspers. They are a structure found only on the males. And they are for internal fertilization. So with bo- with bony fish, the female will lay her eggs, and then the male will sort of swim over them, and then he will just sort of dump his sperm on them. Right. And that's how that happens. I don't know of any. There probably are some, just because <clears throat> fish are extremely diverse. So I'm sure that there are some that have figured out some kind of way to do internal fertilization. But most of them don't. Whereas sharks, it is, I think the the general rule, I, I don't know of any off the top of my head of sharks that don't use internal fertilization with claspers. And so they are part of their, uh, I believe, pelvic fins. Uh, maybe they're anal fins. But one of, one of their fins closer to the that region of the body. And there's one on each side. And the, the sort of sperm travel down that. In, uh, into the fem- into the female, and they have internal fertilization. This is, and this is going to be a dumb question, but I assume this is sexual reproduction as opposed to just like the spraying of sperm that takes yes. place with the regular bony fish. Okay, right. yep. Well, that was clinical. Yeah, they also have really incredible structures called the ampullae of Lorenzini, which is an excellent name. It's wonderful. My 11th grade English teacher was named Mrs. Lorenzini. So shout out to her. <laughs> these are, awesome. these are how sharks sense electricity. Sharks can oh. sense electricity. This is, yeah, they've got a bunch of extra senses, don't mm-hmm. they? I mean, that's, that's the big one. Right. Really? Okay. But yeah, so they have mostly around their face, but also they have a line of them down their body, uh, that are basically just filled with jelly that at one point I had, I was taught the actual chemical reason why it works. I vaguely remember it, but it's not really worth getting into just mm-hmm. for, because we've got a lot to talk about and we've already been yes, doing this do. for 20 minutes. Um, so sharks, especially hammerheads are really well known for it because that's kind of partially why we think their head is so wide like that. They're mostly found on like the underside of shark heads. On like okay. their snout. So that's potentially why hammerheads made their face so wide so that they could just swim along the bottom of the ocean. And if they, like a metal detector, if they happen to pass over something that is edible, they will know it's there. Is that what that sense is for? Mm-hmm. If you're, if you get an electric pulse, that probably means that there's something that's edible. Or just something alive. You know, even right. you just sitting here... You know, your synapses, you know, whether it's just you sitting there, uh, you know, you breathing, you know, synapses have to fire for your muscles in your diaphragm to move for you to breathe. So you produce a very, very small electric charge. And fish do the same, especially in the ocean, where salt water is extremely conductive of electricity. Yep. And so they can sense that. They have to be obviously reasonably close, you know, they're not going to detect it from, you know, like half a mile away, but they can sense the electricity of just the animal sitting there and they'll just swoop in and grab it. Yeah, that answers my question. I was going to ask what purpose that serves, but Mm -hmm. that makes sense. So again, none of these things that we've talked about are the case for fish, what most people would call fish. And so again, and I could go on and on and on about how 
Chondrichthians are different than Osteichthians, so sharks are different than fish. But let's move on to talk about sort of the taxonomy and what what are the different varieties of shark. Because they all look relatively similar. Like you said, they're all vaguely shark-shaped, except for one group that decided to do a stingray thing on their own. But we'll talk about them separately. So sharks are, like I said, chondrichthians. They are members of the group along with rays and skates. So rays are things like your stingray, your manta ray. Skates do something similar to rays, except they still have a very sharky tail. Mm -hmm. So they're flat in the front and then a tail much more like a shark than a stingray. And so sharks, rays, and skates make up a group called the elasmobranchs, which... Can you say that sentence one more time, but like with some rhythm? (laughs) Wait, why? Sharks, rays, and snakes make up the elasmobranchs or whatever it was. Uh, I'm not sure how pronunciation works, oh but like that was fun. That was good. I like that. But yeah, so sharks, rays, and skates make up the elasmobranchs. <laughs> so uh, I don't know exactly what the root of that is. I'm Brank tells me that it is something to do with their gills. Um, mm-hmm. And then there is another group outside of that that are chondrichthians, but they are a separate group from sharks, rays, and skates are... Uh, called chimeras or ratfish you might have heard them called they also have most of the things that i mentioned they still have cartilage bones uh they have their their pectoral fins are separate from their head um they look shark adjacent but you can tell you're like that's it's a weird fish that looks kind of sharky but it's not a shark Mm -hmm. we will talk about them quite a bit because they didn't (laughs) used to look like that they used to look very sharky we will talk about them at length in a little bit so Wonderful. when it comes to sharks themselves, not even including rays and skates, just sharks are, there are around 500 living species. So not nearly as diverse as like the bony fish, which are easily over 10,000 species easily. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are generally l- rather large. Like you said, there are some that are, much smaller, but they range in size from the smallest shark. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but I remember seeing it was somewhere around a foot and a half. So relative, quite small. Yeah. All the way up to the largest fish alive today in the ocean, the whale shark. There's an asterisk asterisk on that because like I said earlier, I said, we are fish. That means whales are also technically fish. Yeah, right. So this is this is one of those things where it definitely uh, becomes right. so broad that <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Right, but whale sharks are still what people would call fish. Okay. So whale sharks can get up around 40-ish or so feet. Man. Still quite large. Not nearly as large as things like blue whales, which get to like 100 feet. But even still, if people sleep on just how big 40 feet can be. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a that's... big animal. Right, like that, yeah, that's conceivable. You're like, oh, that's just like, you know, four basketball hoops. That's huge. That's very large. Yes. And so today we have eight orders of sharks. So if you remember, you know, your classic Linnaean taxonomy of kingdom phylum class order. Which so, we've discussed before is mm-hmm. a wild oversimplification. Right. Not always the best way to classify things, but that's what we, we got. Yeah. So we have eight living orders of sharks and three sort of extinct ones Mm -hmm. so and surprisingly some of them are not as closely related to others as you might think so the largest uh are the carcariniforms which include your tiger sharks your bull sharks most of the sharks that you think of with sharks with a couple notable exceptions um Mm -hmm. tiger sharks bull sharks most reef sharks like black tip reef sharks uh white tip reef sharks, uh, hammerheads are in this group as well. And their sort of characteristic is that they have a membrane that comes over their eye when they attack things. Cause they, they can't, they don't have eyelids. They can't close their eyes. So they right. have this membrane that comes over it to sort of protect their eye a bit more than just having it exposed. They're not the only ones that have this, but, uh, all of them do have it. And that only comes and closes their eye when they're attacking. Yep. Okay. Next, we have the heterodontiforms, which are your bullhead sharks. 
this is a pretty small group. I'm pretty sure they're found only off of like the coast of California and Baja, California in so like, like the West coast of North America, essentially. Right. And they're known for as heterodont sort of implies that they have a little bit of tooth differentiation, which is really interesting because other than mammals, that's all that, that's not all that common. All other vertebrates mostly have, you know, the teeth in the front of their mouth are basically the same as the ones in the back. What's different about their teeth then? They're just sort of shaped differently depending on where they are in the mouth. So like the front ones are more sharp for grabbing things. And then the ones in the back are sort of more flat and blunt for crushing things. Like ours are. What what do we have? Like, don't we have... Don't we have the same thing where ours are, you know, sort of flat in the front and then you get your molars as you go on back? Right. Yeah. And like I said, mammals are okay. real good at tooth differentiation. Oh, oh I'm sorry. But, okay, but yes. every other group does not. Oh, pretty much. Uh, understood. Um, yeah. So they're, they're kind of neat. Next, we have your hexacanthiforms, which are your six guild sharks. That uh, name seems to fit. Mm-hmm. And frilled sharks. They're all pretty deep water. Um, for reasons that I will talk about in our eventual Jaws episode, these guys freak me out a bit because I don't understand them at all. Like having six gills is not a thing that should happen, Re- Ooh, but okay. we'll I, talk we'll about save it. that for later. Yeah, we will talk about that. Um, but anyway, very deep water, very cryptic ones. Um, next we have a name that I'm probably going to butcher, but we have the or orectolobiforms. Hmm. These are your carpet sharks, things like your nurse sharks, ones, uh, wobegongs, and as well as the whale shark as well is in this group. The whale shark is a real weird member of this group because all the rest of them sort of hang out on reefs and eat shellfish. They have generally pretty like crushing style teeth, very flat instead of like the typical sharp pointy shark teeth. So they uh, will just sort of sit and kind of go along the bottom and they eat things like clams and, and other things with tough shells. Right. And then, the, and then the whale shark is just giant and eats krill. Sure. We have the pristioforiforms, which are your saw sharks, which are different than saw fish. Saw fish are in, I think, the skates group. So they're not sharks. They're closely related, but not sharks. But then we do have saw sharks, which are actual sharks. They're very similar in that they have the long nose with sort of the teeth that come off the side of the nose which is way more doable when you are literally covered on in teeth when, when your skin <laughs> is teeth that yeah. kind of thing can happen skin is teeth um next we have these squaliforms which are your dogfish sharks these are very common in fact if you've ever dissected a shark any listeners uh you almost certainly dissected uh the species squalus acanthius the dogfish uh which is a member oh, of this why group. Is that? Just because they're very common. They're small enough to fit in a tray. <laughs> okay. Um, this, is, this is more about convenience yes. than, you know, laws or preservation or anything. Right. Okay. We have the squantini forms, or squatini forms, which are your angel sharks, which is a group that I that are very similar to rays that I mentioned. They're very flat, uh, but they're not rays. They are true sharks. It's a bunch of technical reasons that we don't have time to get into, but they are okay. sharks and not rays. And then we have the group that is contains the shark that everyone's been waiting for to this point. We have the lamniforms, which is most of sort of the, some of the bigger sharks, uh, obviously with the exception of like the whale shark. Um, this would be your basking sharks, which are another large filter feeding shark. Uh, megamouth sharks, which are again, a large filter feeding shark. Goblin sharks, thresher sharks, makos, and the great white shark. Yes. And this group is really well known for giving live birth. No, the other ones don't? The, mm, there are probably members, but it is not a general rule for any group but this one. Is the general rule eggs, I take it then? Yes. Different okay. kinds of eggs than fish. Uh, fish right. eggs seem similar or seem sort of familiar because like many things like fish lay that kind of egg. We've all seen finding Nemo um, yes. as well as like frogs and amphibians lay essentially the same kind of egg as fish. Shark eggs are a little different um, just like structurally. It's more of like a pouch 
than an egg. So there is a little bit of like a protective thing around it, but not much. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, but these lamniform sharks, they do still have eggs. The eggs just sort of hatch inside the mother. So okay. they're in the egg for a very short amount of time. They hatch from the egg and then they still have the yolk inside. So sometimes you might have heard at some point of like great white sharks are, are so vicious and ravenous that they eat each other inside the mother. I mean, that's a gross oversimplification that does yeah. that does happen but um, with humans though sometimes with like twins like well okay that's that's a, a, they don't actually eat each other in like, humans right. these sharks actually eat each other <laughs> really yes okay all right fair enough it's again a, a, a big oversimplification but that that does happen okay. so those are all of our living orders of sharks our extinct orders, like I said, we have three. We have the Cladosalacaforms, which are from the late Devonian to the early Carboniferous, ranging from about 375 to 340 million years ago. They have two dorsal fins, with each with a spine at the front of it, which wasn't all that uncommon, honestly, in sharks. A lot of sharks have that. Even though Some sharks even today kind of have that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, also, they may not actually be sharks. <laughs> Why is this? They, I, I saw mixed things, whether they were with sharks or whether they were with the chimeras, the weird ratfish things that I said we're going to talk about a lot. Right. Because they got very sharky and were real similar to each other. <laughs> okay. We don't, I'm leaning toward most of the more recent things that I saw said that this group was actually with the chimeras and not sharks, but. It's worth throwing in here because it is sort of uncertain. Just in the interest of full completeness. Right. But the next two are for sure with sharks. So we have the hybodontiforms from the early Carboniferous to the end Cretaceous, around 360 to uh, 66 million years ago. So they were around for quite a long time, almost 300 million years. These are... 66 million years ago, is there... Do they go out for, we think, similar reasons to dinosaurs? Well, similar event, you know, okay. or the, the same event. Uh, the right. oceans obviously are much different than on land. Uh, right. Okay. But we've they, talked about how that's complicated, but I did notice it, you know, right, 66 yes. million mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Then we, uh, or this group is known for having sort of conical teeth instead of like the sharp sort of flat, normal shark teeth. These had teeth much more like dolphins instead of sharks, which is interesting. Mm, okay. And then we have the Xenacanthiforms from the early Carboniferous through the late Triassic, again, 360 million years to 201-ish million years ago. These ones go extinct at the end Triassic mass extinction. Hmm. So these ones had a weird, really long serrated spine that points backwards from like the back of their head backwards, like a, right. like a reverse unicorn, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these ones are very eel-like. So they had a fin that stretches for most of their entire back instead of like the dorsal fin that we see in a shark, which is sort of like the single triangle-shaped thing in the middle of the back. Yep. These ones had a fin that stretched most of their back. Uh, And they were almost entirely freshwater as well, which is odd for sharks. Right. So those are the ones that we have, the different kinds of shark varieties. So let's get into some of their evolution. So if you Google fossil shark there's one that will very obviously come up and there's a reason that i haven't talked about it yet we will we will get there i'm googling it now because i have no idea what you're referencing here no uh no don't don't then no. i want no. i want the surprise all right i will not look okay but anybody else who knows anything about extinct sharks there's one that you're thinking of we will get Is there it, it... Uh, no we will we'll get there Okay, I have a gas. <laughs> um, so other than the obvious one, you'll likely get results for a group called the Acanthodians. This group was around from like the early Silurian period, so long ago, 443-ish million years ago, to the late Permian, 252-ish million years ago. They went extinct at the end Permian mass extinction, the Great Dying. Um, right. So, but they were around, again, that's, almost 200 million years. They were around for quite a while. 
we used to think that this group um, w- was sort of the common ancestor group between sharks and bony fish. But we used to think that. we used to think that. And we thought that because they showed a, an interesting combination of some traits of both. Uh, for example, they did have like a bony plate covering their gills like like bony fish do. And the, but but their tails were sort of upturned like a shark. So if you look at like a shark skeleton, um, their vertebrae at their tail go up into sort of the upper lobe of their tail fin. Whereas with bony fish, their tail fin are similar to like their uh, pectoral fins where they're just rays of stuff. There's no actual real bone. Like there is bone, but not like vertebrae in like mm-hmm. the actual very tip part of their tail. Okay. So these had the gill area much more like a bony fish and the tail area much more like a shark. So we kind of thought this group was sort of the common ancestor group of both where they, where they split. We don't think that anymore. We think that this group is sort of the group that sharks came from, but not the one that bony fish came from. We think they came from a group called the placoderms. Very interesting group. We could make an entire episode about that group, and I plan to at some point, because they're extremely cool, but we don't have time to get into that today. It's a very packed episode. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so the Acanthodians essentially looked like just odd sharks. Like, if you saw it, you'd be like, hmm. Something shark? Different. Maybe? Maybe? <laughs> it looks much more like a shark than any other kind of fish. And so they had two dorsal fins, each with the spine in front of it, like I said, with one of the extinct groups of sharks and some sharks today. Uh, They had uh, a lot of things. The the general sort of shape is shark adjacent. They're not quite torpedo-y like a shark is. They're much more side-to-side compressed Mm -hmm. than we see with sharks today. But this group is kind of a mess. As it, like their taxonomy. So we, we don't really know which of like the subgroups within this group sharks came from, but we know we're, well, we don't know. We're very confident that sharks came from some member of this group. We don't know which one, but we we're pretty confident in that. Okay. So the earliest thing that we can tell was like really sharky were scales. We don't have a body fossil, but we see scales, which makes sense. I've talked before, I'm sure in several episodes, that teeth fossilize really well because yes, I do remember this. Because enamel is just much more durable than even, you know, bone. You know, it's just much more durable and like chemically. And when you're covered in teeth, as sharks are, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, they shed their scales too, not quite like a lizard or something sheds their skin like that, but they're constantly sort of replacing their scales as they grow. And so uh, it makes sense that we'd find scales because like I said, they're teeth and they preserve quite well, but we don't, we have no idea what this animal actually looked like, but we see shark or very, very shark E scales show up in the late Silurian period around 420 million years ago is when we think, the shark lineage really started to sort of show up. Mm -hmm. The first time that we see sort of real sharks, we get into the Devonian period, which is really well known for things like uh, when tetrapods started coming on land, you know, things with our, our ancestors, essentially giant amphibians started showing up. Um, That's when we first see the first true sharks and we see some, some, teeth like actual teeth that we're pretty sure are sharky from the middle devonian but still nothing from a body which again makes sense because a teeth fossilize very well and cartilage cartilage fossilizes very very poorly <laughs> mm-hmm. i mean it makes you know just less hard exactly so the first real evidence that we have of shark body fossils are from that group called the xenocanthiforms, the, the group with the backward spine that are kind of just long and the freshwater group. They show up in the middle to late Devonian period. This is somewhere around 380-ish million years ago or so. And 
like I said, they are exclusively in freshwater and they're very eel like, like I said, with being sort of side to side flattened like eels kind of are. They look a lot like eels. You know, their mouth is in the front like like an eels is and not underneath like a shark's is. Uh, not yet, anyway. <laughs> we also see around this time that those Cladosolacaforms, the group that I was like, might be sharks, but also might be the Chimera thing. Right. They show up around this time as well. And the reason that we thought they were sharks for a really long time was because they're actually pretty torpedo shaped like modern sharks are. So we saw that and we're like, must be a shark. Right. Um, but once we got better fossils preserved, uh, mostly like their skull anatomy is what tells us that they're probably not sharks and with that they're actually with chimeras instead. But they're really important because their mouth was still at the front. And there's some evidence that they might have had claspers. That's really speculated. So this was sort of like, okay, maybe this was when claspers showed up. We don't know. So yeah, okay. again, the, the xenocanthiforms were definitely sharks. These other ones, probably not. So it's like some shark evidence, but they're not really doing shark things yet. They're not right. the big dominant predators yet, or even close. Then we get to the Carboniferous period after the Devonian period. So the Carboniferous is from 358 to 298 million years ago. This is the time that we talked about in our fossil fuels episode a lot. This is when, you know, really big coal swamps and things like that were around really high sea levels, a uh, really warm planet. So this was a really, really good time for Chondrichthians as a whole. Um, right. So there were, from what I could tell, 45 different families, and that's across all sorts of Chondrichthians, compared to 55 today. Which you might think, well, we have more today, so it doesn't seem like it's that high. However, these I are fossils. Ask that question. These are 300 plus million year old fossils we're talking about. <laughs> so it's like, that's just a lot of time for fossils to have been destroyed. So I guarantee that we don't have everything so the from this time. Is that there was probably more at some point. Yes, I guarantee that there were more running around at this time. Yeah, that around. we don't know yet. So chimeras are actually the group that do super well during this time. The shark mm -hmm. ancestors were there. They're, they're around. But the chimera ancestors do really well. And they are much more common than sharks. However, if you saw one you'd probably be like, that's a funky looking shark. You wouldn't say that's shark adjacent. You would say that is a shark. It just looks weird. Okay. So even though these are not sharks, when you Google prehistoric sharks, members of this group will come up because they look so much like sharks. So I want to talk about a couple of them. A, because they're just incredibly weird. <laughs> they get super weird. And obviously these are sort of the end members. Most of them were much more normal looking. But these ones will come up just because they're entertaining and interesting. So the first one I want to, that I want to talk about is called Stethacanthus. It was about two, a little less than two and a half feet long. And other than its dorsal fin, it looked very much like a shark. However, the dorsal fin, instead of being like the triangle shape that we're sort of used to, right. at the top, it was flat. And like Happen. disc okay. shaped. The thing that it reminds me a lot of is sort of like a, a sonar thing on the top of a ship that you might see that like round disc shape that you might see. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So it was roughly not quite parallel with like the back of the animal, but close. And I've also heard it described as like the shape of an anvil, very flat on top and rather wide. So not like thin and blade like like a uh, like a shark's dorsal fin is today. However, on top of that, along with on the top of its head, were things that are essentially teeth. And yes, I've said a couple times that sharks are literally covered in teeth, but these are large, kind of sharp and pointy, not the normal scale shape. So on mm -hmm. the top of this thing, it was just covered in spikes as well as it had a very spiky part sort of on its forehead, essentially. And we have 
absolutely no idea what this was for. A spiky part on its forehead. I, wow. And and it's well, that's not the part that gets nearly as much attention as as the dorsal fin, just because again, we have absolutely yeah. no idea what this could have been used for. Like obviously there are people who have come up with guesses, but none of them are even close to like Yeah, that's that makes sense for that shape. They're all just that. They're guesses. Exactly. So, very weird. Um, but the one that gets much more talk is a quote-unquote shark called Helicoprion. And it's sort of a member of a group called the Whirl Toothed. You know, again, quote-unquote sharks. They mm. look very sharky, with the exception of their jaws. So they're very shark-shaped. Their body and, and tails and fins are very sharky. But their teeth, at least for the specific genus Helicoprion, their teeth in the top jaw seem more or less normal. But in the bottom jaw, they are arranged in a buzzsaw-shaped disc. Now, what do you mean by a buzzsaw? Say, what, what does that mean? They are not along the jaw like you would expect them to be. They mm-hmm. are in the middle of the mouth along a single plane. All right. like, a, like they have a circular saw. For a bottom jaw. And they have a normal looking upper jaw, but they have that on the, with the. Hmm. So Helicoprion, yes, there are other members of that are related to it that have buzz saws for both the top and bottom. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's weird or less weird, but gee, okay. So the reason why Helicoprion gets a lot, talked about a lot is A, just again, because that's just very strange. What were you using that for? But also because for a very long time, we only had the jaw and the teeth like in that pattern. We didn't know where this was because, again, when your entire body is covered in a layer of teeth, this could hypothetically be anywhere on your body. (laughs) So various reconstructions have placed this circle of teeth anywhere from the dorsal fin. So it had a spiral of teeth coming off its the fin on its back. That it had one of those each on its pectoral fins, the ones on its sides. So it could swim and cut things with its fins. Uh, that it had it at the end of its tail and would use its tail defensively to cut things with its tail. <laughs> um, as well as sort of the, the one that you'll probably see most often that is incorrect is that it would sort of be, that would be the end of its bottom jaw and it would curl under its like chin and form like a circle of teeth under its chin. That was very popular for at least 50, 60 years. That was how Helicoprion was reconstructed in all sorts of art. And that's no longer, that's fallen out of favor. Yes. Okay. Cause I, to my knowledge, we, I, I believe that we found a, decently preserved one where we could tell it's okay this is like in the mouth right so again these are not sharks but you will very often see them presented as sharks up until doing the research for this i thought they were sharks (laughs) and this is what (laughs) i do for a living to make well yeah because again other than you know the the face of helicoprion and the the dorsal fin of stethacanthus they look incredibly like sharks but again they're more closely related to chimeras ratfish those kinds of animals so moving back to the shark things so sharks were like i said around obviously sort of in the background during this entire time they just weren't nearly as common or as fun as uh as these chimera relatives so then the permian period comes uh which lasts from 298 to 252 million years ago Chimeras do much less well during this time and become much less fun and exciting. I'm sure if you asked a Chimera researcher, they wouldn't agree. But uh, <laughs> Then uh, the true sharks start to do much better during the Permian period. This is when the Hybodontiforms show up, the ones with the dolphin-like teeth. And they sort of show up in the middle of this, of this period. And surprisingly they kind of don't even flinch at the end Permian mass extinction. Really? They lose a little bit of diversity, but compared to total 
depend, de- right, depending on who you ask, anywhere from 90 to 95 of all species went extinct during this time. Uh, from what I saw, around 80% of total sharks made it through. So sharks did very well during this time. You, it's noticeable that they took a hit, but given the state of the planet at the time, <laughs> mm-hmm. they did quite well. Um, and this group also does, you know, stays and, and does quite well throughout the entire Mesozoic, you know, the time of the dinosaurs as well. Right. So the end Permian, like I said, doesn't affect sharks all that much, but it does kill off a lot of the really strange looking ones, at least strange compared to our modern sharks, which this is when our modern sharks start to get a real fin hold in. <laughs> You just said that. I sure did. And so um, it's it's really interesting, though, because they had much more competition in the Mesozoic. So af- after the Permian mass extinction, we get to the Mesozoic era, which is, you know, the Triassic period, the Jurassic period, and the Cretaceous period. Mm-hmm. They had much more competition in the oceans during this time because although the placoderms were gone, the, the group that I said probably was the group that bony fish evolved from. They were generally pretty big meat eating fish. Right. They, they went extinct before the end premium mass extinction. So that's one last thing they're competing against. But during the Mesozoic, that is when a bunch of different marine reptiles start showing up. Ooh, okay. Things like your ichthyosaurs, your plesiosaurs, which are your Loch Ness monster looking reptiles. And then your mosasaurs toward the end of the Cretaceous show up as well. Your uh, giant aquatic thing from Jurassic World. Or, uh, yeah, Jurassic World. So lots of things that could be doing shark the shark's job, essentially. However, sharks are just kind of like, all right, bet. And they also continue doing things. And this is also when bony fish start really taking off and doing well, too, because they were kind of also just sort of in the background for most of this time. Um. So they have much more competition, but they they just kind of rise to meet the challenge, which is really interesting. Do you think that was because they were just better suited for the environment? Is that because they were like they were just there was more resources, and so you know there's you know room for more diversity, or is it just sort of like a an accident of you know biologic history? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> so sharks are very good at doing what they do. Yes. Um, however, they are not, you know, the only good way to do what they do. So it is kind of just a biological roll of the dice, mm-hmm. you know, but there, there's a lot of factors that go into it that I, I don't feel that I myself am qualified to really t- speak on, to be honest, at least right. without doing more research into it, which I haven't done. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Triassic period, most of the Triassic period, so that's the, the first period of the Mesozoic right after the big extinction, things are still kind of recovering from the extinction just because it was so bad. <laughs> most <laughs> of the Triassic is spent recovering from that extinction, um, only to be ended by another mass extinction at the end of the Triassic. <laughs> so at the end of that mass extinction, we get the Jurassic period from 201 to uh, 145 million years. And uh, most of the modern groups of sharks, all of those orders that we talked about at the beginning, that are still alive. Almost all of them show up during the Jurassic. So they've been around for quite a long time. Um, This is when sort of their mouths get much bigger and their mouths also sort of migrate from the front to underneath their head where we see them today. And they start to develop crushing teeth, things like nurse sharks have. Uh, today for crushing shells uh, because shell you know things have always been pretty common but things like clams do very very well in the cretaceous period and jurassic period so it's like well if clams are doing well things that eat clams are also doing well right and then this is where they also sort of really get that torpedo-y shaped body to be much faster in the water and that kind of goes with what you were talking about before just being optimized to swim forward really fast right 
And well, that's not, actually that sort of tangentially reminds me of something that I met, thought to meant, meant to mention earlier, but did not. Um, most people probably have heard at some point that sharks can only breathe while they swim. I had not heard that, but is that correct? For some of them, some sharks okay. can only do that. That is called ram ventilation, which is an excellent word or excellent phrase. Yeah. Because they just ram their face through the water. Um, so with bony fish, they're operculum. They can basically make like a little vacuum. So they can close the operculum, gulp in some water, close their mouth, and then open the operculum. And that sort of forces water th- over their gills while while they're not moving. So that's why if you see fish just sort of sitting there, opening, closing their mouth, that's how they breathe. Many okay. sharks can actually do something similar to that too, where just the, it's again, much less efficient, but they just the act of opening and closing their mouth forces water over their gills. Some actually have uh, sort of a hole in the top of their head that used to be a gill uh, called a spherical or sp- spherical. Yeah. Hmm. And so that sort of acts as like a water intake. They can sort of suck water in through that over their gills. So some sharks like nurse sharks uh, sleep on the bottom of the ocean and they can just kind of chill. Their breathing is less efficient when they're not moving, but they can still do it. Whereas right, okay. so, some of the bigger ones, things like, uh, like I don't believe bull sharks can. I think they have to be moving. Um, I, th- I think so tiger sharks need to be moving. So sharks can't breathe unless they're moving is only applies to certain varieties of shark and is too broad to be set up to be used appropriately. Right. That is the minority of sharks. Yes. Okay. So anyway, tangent aside. Um, then we get to the Cretaceous period. 145 to 66 million years ago, where we have basically modern sharks. I, I believe that the last currently, you know, extant, you know, alive shark order to evolve, evolved very closely after the Cretaceous. So uh, I believe seven of the eight that I mentioned at the beginning that are still around are around by the Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. So we have a really fun shark named Tychotis which is a giant nurse shark that was around 30 feet long. Very big shark. For reference, great whites get around 20, maybe like 22 feet long. So this is... It's a very, very large shark. However, like nurse sharks, they had the very flat, crushy teeth to eat shells and things. Not the big, spiky teeth. So so they were that big, but they were... They weren't like predators. Well, they were predators if you're a clam. Oh, okay. They weren't predators for they weren't predators for other things that you know were larger. Right. Okay. Um, but there were sharks that were not closely related to great whites, but like great white size, there were a decent number of them. Mm-hmm. So, and and they got larger throughout the Cretaceous period, which is interesting because that's when the competition was kind of at the highest. We had. Lots of marine reptiles. We had lots of really large bony fish. And then sharks were like, okay, I guess I'll get big too. Why not? So it's just really interesting because most people think of, okay, if one group is doing well, the group that competes with them must inherently do bad. That would seem to make some amount of sense. But it almost never is that simple ever. Of course. <laughs> right. It's, um, it makes sense in theory, but you know, in practice, that's not the way it works. So... Sharks actually do quite well through through the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Um, that's kind of a common thing with sharks is that they do very well across all five of the sort of major mass extinctions. And at least, well, the ones that they were around for. They weren't around for the end or division one. But okay. uh, they, they just generally do quite well compared to a lot of other things, which is just interesting. I've heard some hypotheses that they went to like the really deep oceans to sort of protect themselves. Or at least they had members living in the deep oceans that weren't as heavily affected. Although we do have some evidence that like the deep oceans were sometimes not a great place to be during some of these mass extinctions. So it's really curious that like of all the groups that were around for most of the mass extinctions, they pretty easily do the best. That is strange. It's, 
I mean, again, like you said, sharks are really good at doing what they do, but you mm-hmm. know, why them? Ex- right. Like, and it should, I, and be a, should be an answer. Why them instead of just eh. Right. And I, I don't have an answer to that. But here we are. So once we get to the Paleogene, the period right after the Cretaceous, we get the first filter feeding sharks, things like your whale sharks, your uh, Greenland sharks, your megamouth shark. And uh, we also get our first hammerheads as well. Hammerheads were the most recent shark family to evolve. Once we get to the Neogene, which is the period right before the one that we are in right now. So this started around 23 million years ago. We get a, uh, a little known species that you you may have heard of it, maybe, uh, called have it. Otodus megalodon. Uh, the, uh, the second part of that I feel like I've heard. Yes, this is the shark that I was like, don't, we're not going to talk about it. We're- so I was going to, I was going to say, I thought I remembered a Facebook post from one Gavin Davidson uh, from a few days ago. You that, sure did. That may have tipped me off. Yes. So Megalodon is a very, very large shark. To my knowledge, it is the largest shark, including whale sharks. It is at le- like the smallest size estimates put it about equal to whale sharks in size. Which Most about 40 feet, you about said? 40 feet. Most estimates put it bigger somewhere between 50, 60 feet. Older estimates put it closer to like 80 feet. That's no longer really accepted though. So it'd still be, that's just a, I mean, like it'd be terrifying, oh but a joy goodness. to see. Right. I wish I could see it. So this species is sort of bounced around a lot. So at first we thought it was, much more closely related to actually at one point we thought it was directly ancestral to great white sharks. So great white sharks evolved from Megalodon. That's what we thought at one point. We don't really think so anymore. Uh, we think great whites are much more closely related to like Mako sharks. Mm-hmm. Um, so at various points, Megalodon has been in the, the genera Carcharocles, Carcharodon. Um, but now it is generally considered in the genus Otodus. But you will almost always just hear it called Megalodon, which means, which name. right, it literally means giant tooth. That's literally what it means. And so this, again, just gigantic animal, 40, 60 feet long, somewhere in that area. Their jaws were about eight feet wide. Huge. Eight feet wide. Wide. So, <laughs> I, I can't do anything but laugh. Whales, uncoincidentally, also get very, very large at this time. And we start seeing baleen whales, you know, the large filter feeding whales like blue whales. And that's what Megalodon was eating. It ate whales. It so, ate whales. It ate whales. It ate whales. And so. I... whales kind of e- even though we you know without human meddling uh we do have several kinds of very large filter feeding whales around today but they were sort of at their peak around this time around 20 or so million years ago um and then megalodon went extinct somewhere around two and three somewhere in there million years ago recent but it is definitely extinct. <laughs> I didn't know this was a controversy until I saw your Facebook post the other day. It wasn't until a couple of years ago. And we will talk about that extensively in episode 31.5. And it's because of Shark Week. I, It's going to be quite hard for me to not use expletives. I mean, it's a bonus episode. so And this is also really your podcast. I just That's upload, fair. So you can do whatever you want. I'll, I'll, we'll see. We'll see. But it is much more common than it used to be that people believe that Megalodon is still around. Not scientists. No, <laughs> no, no. Sci- this is not a thing that is ever like legitimately debated among scientists that Megalodon is extinct. It is extinct. If there was a 60 foot shark that ate whales swimming around in the ocean, we would know, we know about, about it. it. Yeah. We would know about it. Because frankly, we've done a really good job at killing all of the whales. <laughs> so, yeah. right. It's like, so if, if we were killing off 
what it ate. That would inherently make it have to move to new areas, try to eat new things. We, we would know for sure. Are there many things that live in the ocean that we don't know about yet, particularly in, in the deep ocean? Yes, absolutely. But they're not 60 feet long whale eating animals. <laughs> Right, it's just, it's just similar to like space. Like we would know, we know about all the planets. We don't know about every asteroid because there it can be a lot smaller. But like, you know, we know about the planets that are close to the sun and easy to be seen. I know there's the whole planet X thing mm-hmm. separate, but wow. like, you know, it's you would know if there's something that big. Yes, we would. And so, uh, we will talk at length about Shark Week later this weekend i i really encourage you to listen to it because it's going to be a lot of fun for me to just vent um but anyway. i might not even show up i might just like <laughs> press the record button and just let gavin go no i i want you there i want i want some, some <laughs> I other opinions there. so um anyway back to sharks so by that point but by, by the time megalodon shows up short of megalodon and other megalodon megalodon does have relatives there are other members of the genus ototus that are also large sharks. None got as big as Megalodon, but it does have relatives. Um, And so, but with them aside, we mostly have what we have today for sharks. They're all torpedo shaped with the exception of the ones that are like the saw sharks or the angel sharks, the ones that get kind of flat and do stingray things. Um, Mm -hmm. We have basically modern sharks pretty much for all of the Cenozoic. The last 66 million years have more or less been modern sharks and sharks have been at the top of the, the food web basically the entire time. Um, so sharks have a really long, really interesting history and it is such a big charismatic group that they really deserve their own week. I think um, they don't deserve what well. has been done to it <laughs> in, in the handful of years recently. So that's all I've got about sharks. Um, I was going to say, if that if that's about it on sharks, I don't want to delve too deep into uh, Shark Week other than feelings are going to be primarily negative towards at least the current iteration of Shark Week. I think that's fair. That's fair to say. And the plan will be we're going to aim for um, an upload on Saturday for cool. the bonus episode 31.5 on Shark Week. We probably should have done this the week before Shark Week, but... No, yeah. no, it's during Shark Week. We've got to get that search engine optimization. <laughs> Everyone's Fair looking enough. for Shark Week. Fair enough. Well, we can uh, we can end this podcast there on sharks themselves and just how um, interesting and diverse and uh, you know different than us creatures they are. Uh, Gavin, is there anything else you'd like to add on this? I don't think so. They're just really cool, really wacky animals. Uh, cool and wacky indeed. I believe uh, at one point... My family, you remember the, um, those like portable DVD players that you could go in cars and then mm-hmm. you could put them on the back of a, like a seat for children to watch. Yeah. We, um, in my family, I think my parents at one point tried to buy us Jaws to watch. <laughs> However, they didn't look at the DVD close enough and they bought us like a documentary called Jaws of the Pacific, Ooh. which we watched endlessly because we didn't care and we thought it was the coolest thing ever (laughs) just these sharks i don't remember a thing from it but Mm -hmm. i know we watched it a whole bunch just all these different um all these different cool things about sharks so they are there's a little bit of you know dinosaur you know large predator exactly it's different so Mm -hmm. um and i am this was a uh, a fun episode to go over so thank you gavin very much keep an eye out for episode 31.5 coming out uh this weekend if you're listening to these as they come out And we will see all of you guys for a full episode next Wednesday. Take care, everyone.